Well, good morning, North Klein. It's so good to have you with us this morning. If you would, take a moment and share the link with your friends and family. Let's get as many people in this worship service as we can. Guests, thank you so much for joining us. We are so honored for you to be with us today. We would love to connect with you. There's a number on our screen. And if you wouldn't mind, we would ask you to just type your first and last name uh, and text us at that number. And if you'll do that, one of our ministers is going to reach out to you this week and simply say, thank you for coming and being with us. And is there anything we can do to help you? We're so excited to worship today. Stephen Morris, our lead pastor, is out of town on a much needed vacation. We're going to miss him, but we've got a double blessing this morning. David Gentiles is going to be leading us in worship today and every Sunday throughout August. And Scott Riling, one of our pastors from the Champions Campus, who many of you know well, he's been on staff for years, is actually bringing our message today. So we're so excited to hear from Scott. Let's get uh, started this morning and start off with prayer as we kick off our new study in the book of James. Father, we honor you, we praise you, we worship you, we glorify you this morning. Lord, we're here to grow close to you and to, to lift up your holy name. And so, Father, open our hearts, open our spirits, open our eyes and our ears, and help us to learn uh, this morning and grow closer to you as we honor you in everything that happens during this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's so good to worship with you. Let's lift our voices, our hearts together. Our God has done great things. Let us sing together all the need. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. And he has done great things. Our hero. Oh, he Yeah. 
Well, what a great reminder of something that we should always be thinking about and uh, praising God for. He is a good, good Father. We're going to spend some time praying uh, together right here, right now, even though we might be not in the same place exactly. Uh, God's listening, God's hearing, and uh, His ways are higher than ours. And so I'm so grateful for that, grateful to be here, be a part of this uh, time of worship uh, together. We're also uh, giving, and uh, our offerings look a little different, of course, and uh, so we just want to encourage you to continue uh, giving of your time and your resources and your talents, and you can do that online. You can do that if you like to write a check. Uh, you can also use our PushPay app and just select your campus and uh, be simple and easy to go. All right, let's pray together, and uh, let's remember God's so good. Thank you, God, for being a good, good father, for being perfect in all of your ways, all of them. And in this time, God, we are uh, looking to you to get us through, to protect us, to strengthen us, to heal the broken places, to bring things to light, to bring new life and hope. And God, I just pray that you would do that for someone right now. And they would see you in a totally new light as a good father and who is perfect. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for our time right here this morning. And I pray you would be honored with our songs, with our word, and with our lives. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. It's the name of Jesus that heals. It's the name of Jesus that brings peace. It's the name of Jesus that brought, provides comfort for you and for me right where you are. So let's just pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted high in our homes, in our businesses, in our community, because really it is, it's the only, it's the name of Jesus is the only name that can save. Jesus is the only person that can save. It's the power of God is the only thing that can save us, one from our sins, but one even just from place where we are right now, sometimes a place of confusion, a place of misunderstanding, maybe even a place of not being able to see what tomorrow or next week is, but it's the person of Jesus and the name of Jesus that brings peace, that brings rest to the human heart. So Lord, we just thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. It is your name that anything and everything happens in our lives. It's your work on the cross that provides for us the kind of peace that we desperately need right now. And first and foremost, that peace is peace with you, God. We have peace with you, Lord, because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, wearing our sin, becoming our sin, placing our sin in that tomb and then leaving it there. God, we're so thankful that it's the work of Jesus and the person of Jesus, person of Jesus that brings peace, a relationship of peace with you, and then, Lord, an eternal peace that can be our guide and be our comfort today. And I just pray that the peace of Christ would rule in each home right now. The peace of Christ would rule in each heart. The peace of Christ would rule in our city, in our communities. We need you, Jesus, and we need your peace. We thank you for it, that you give it freely. Where else can we go? Only you are life and only you have the words of life and we're so thankful. And it's in that name of Jesus we sing, pray, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start a new series in the book of James this morning, and so I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open up to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, uh, and as we begin to look at this uh, great book on just basically practical Christianity, I think it was... Um, several years ago, uh, there was a speaker named Dawson McAllister. Probably many of you have, uh, remember him. And I remember he had a series on the book of James. It was a video series back there with VHS in those days. And it was the, the series was called Christianity in Overalls because it's just such a practical book. It just basically talks to us about how to live the Christian faith. Now, as we consider in the introduction here into the book, many of you have probably already studied the book before, but just to, as a reminder, the author was the, the stepbrother, or the half-brother, I should say, of Jesus. So he is the one that's writing this book, and if you can imagine that James was not a believer uh, before the crucifixion of his brother, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, he, but he had watched him live his life, and he remembered what he had said and the things that he had taught, and he just watched him live. And then after that, James became a believer and also a leader in the Jerusalem church. He's the author of this book, and it's, it's really, I think, uh, uh, interesting to think about what he writes in this book. And I wondered, as he wrote these things, if he was reflecting on how he saw Jesus live and the things that he taught and, and then he said. The audience is the dispersion, or as we will see here, um, uh, the, the diaspora as it's called. It was the Jews that were living in all of Asia Minor among the Gentiles. And it was written probably around uh, between 40 and 50 AD. So it was probably one of the earliest New Testament books uh, that was written. 
Now, sometimes when, when, when you're looking at James, or some scholars have noticed, or uh, people through the years, have noticed that uh, uh, James and Paul at times seem like they're at odds. The apostle Paul talked about faith and really emphasized faith and not works. In other words, that the faith that we can have in Jesus Christ cannot be achieved by works. And yet James says in his book, you show me your faith or I'll show you my faith by my works. And it seems like, well, are they saying two separate things? Well, no, not really. True faith is not earned by works, Paul. And good works will be the natural outflow of genuine faith, James. So in a sense, it's just two sides of the same coin. In the book, throughout the book, and we'll be studying it these next several weeks, James talks about topics such as persevering through tough times. In fact, that's what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, he's going to talk about controlling the tongue, submitting to God's will in various circumstances, and what genuine faith really looks like. You, as we talked about how James and Paul were not really at odds, but this being two sides of the same coin, it's really interesting to read James, especially the passage that we are going to look at this morning in chapter 1, against the backdrop of something that Paul wrote. In Romans chapter 8, 28 through 29, you probably know it well. It says, and we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. If you can read James and understand it through the lens of God, is that no matter what we go through, no matter what difficulties we go through, no matter what the circumstances are, ultimately, those who are in faith in Christ, God causes all these things, as only God can do, to work together for good. Well, let's get into the text right now. So if you have your Bibles now open to James chapter 1, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 18, and then I'm going to come back, we're going to focus more on verses 1, uh, the first few verses, about 1 through 8, but we'll also refer to the later verses. So if you have your Bibles now, if you'll just follow along and I'll read it out loud. James, a servant of God and of Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously with, to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which, is, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, and notice that it said earlier, to count it all joy when you encounter various trials in the testing of your faith. Here in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own, he will, uh, I'm sorry, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's pray. Lord, we just pray that you will make your word very clear to us. We pray, Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word. And Lord, show us how to apply it in our lives so that we might live for you and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so what's the first thing that we see here? James, right off the bat, tells us something very, very important. First of all, that we can expect trials. The text says when you encounter various trials, not if. So we will encounter trials. Jesus said that we would have tribulations in this life. He said that in John chapter 16, verse 33. Paul told us the same thing in Acts 14, 22. These trials are going to be a reality of our lives. Just living in this world, we will have trials. I remember many years ago when the kids were little, we had this little experiment, and it was an educational uh, experiment for our kids, and we got a monarch butterfly which was still in the cocoon. And so they sent all of the setup for it, and you had a box for it, and it was, it was tethered to the top, and this little cocoon was in that box, and in a matter of days, it would eventually crack open and a monarch butterfly would emerge from the cocoon. And I just remember the excitement every day when the kids would run down and they'd go take a look at that to see if the cocoon had cracked any or if anything was coming out of the cocoon. Then when we were reading the instructions, we wanted to make sure that we did it right. It was just kind of strange that this thing showed up in the mail and we're going to put this up and then eventually a butterfly is going to come out of it. So I, we read the directions. All of us read the directions very, very carefully. And in bold letters, more than once in the directions it said, do not assist the butterfly coming out of the cocoon. In other words, when you saw that little creature emerging, it was going to quiver, and in fact it did. It would quiver and it would shake, and it just looked like it was struggling so much, and, there, and, and there's the urge to, to get in there and just kind of peel back the cocoon a little bit to try to help the, the little butterfly out. But I said, do not do that. Why? Because if you did that, it would, it would hamper or hinder the proper development of the butterfly. In other words, the butterfly had to struggle for its wings to become fully developed. So the stress and the struggle against getting out of that cocoon was all part of the process, and you didn't want to short-circuit it. In many ways in this life, it's usually in 2020 when we look back, the vision is 2020 looking back, that we realize that when we go through difficult times in our lives, those are usually the times that we grew the most. Those are the times when we learn dependence on God. Those are, those are the times when we experience a, a deeper fellowship, if you will, a deeper dependence on God through the struggle, was actually developing us and, con and conforming us to the image of Jesus. So James says, look, don't curse the trials that come in your life. Rely on God. Trust God. Now, where are these trials going to come from? Well, they're going to come from several places. First of all, they come from ourselves. They come from ourselves. Foolish decisions that we'll make in life sometimes. Maybe uh, uh, circumstances where we didn't think something all the way through and we make a rash decision and then we pay a price a little bit later on. He sa in fact, he, he, he acknowledges this a little bit later in the other verse when he says um, uh, that the person is tempted, but each person, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Do you know what it's like to have something or see something that you want so badly and you begin to play all these mental games and convincing yourself of why this has to be God's will for your life or why you need that, why you got to have that. Yeah, we're, we're great uh, uh, con in convincing and debating among ourselves of why we need something. 
And really, it's just come, it comes from within, within us and something that we want so badly. And sometimes we don't always make the right decisions. And we make rash decisions. So sometimes these tests from life can come from, our own, from, from ourselves and brings them into our lives. Sometimes the tests can come from others. Sometimes people, as Jesus said, that there will be people in this life that will take advantage of you despitefully use you, he said. So sometimes outside forces from others can bring these testings into our lives. Thirdly, our adversary. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Isn't it amazing that since the beginning of time, Satan's agenda has never changed. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But our salvation, our hope, our rescuer is Jesus who came to give us life. The fourth area or, or place that, that testing can come is from God. Yeah. Now the difference is, is the scriptures, remember what it says a little bit later on in verse 13, said, let no one say that he is being tempted by God because God doesn't tempt anybody. Here's the difference. Satan comes to us to test or to tempt us in order to see us fail. God comes at times and brings tests in our lives to see us grow and to, if you will, pass and succeed and move forward. Two different purposes. Now, sometimes when we were in school and we would see, maybe we would have a particular teacher that just looked like they just got a lot of pleasure out of making their tests so hard. And we dreaded those tests. You're tempting me. You're tempting me to anger. You're tempting me to a lot of things. But no, ultimately the teacher was bringing a test in to test your knowledge, to test you, to force you so that you would prepare and that, that you could then succeed and move forward. God sometimes brings things into our lives, not for the purpose of tearing us down or seeing us fail, but to see us succeed and to see, and to see us move forward. In Luke chapter 22, verses 42 through 44, you remember it was Jesus when it was the temptation, or I should say in the, in the, in the garden. And he said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then in verse 43, it says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. You're like, wow, that's the end of the story. Jesus is in agony. He cries out to his Father in heaven, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, remove this cup from me. If there's another way to accomplish this. But he immediately says, but not my will. It's not about me. But not my will, but yours be done. And then it says that an angel came and strengthened him. You're like, wow, there you go. God comes to us in our times of need and rescues us and supports us and strengthens us. But after that came verse 44. Verse 44 said, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. You see, the, the, the testing, the difficulty, the hardship in Jesus' life didn't just go away when the angel left. No, he was strengthened, but what? but he persevered. It strengthened him to carry on and to persevere and to keep his eye on the gold. And what was that? It was the cross. He was going to the cross for you and for me. The angel came and strengthened him in his time of need, but he still had to go through the trial and the test, if you will. In verse 13, it says, let no one say that when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God, for God cannot tempt with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
But God gives the grace in the midst of that temptation, or in the, in the midst of that test, I should say, to strengthen us to succeed. So not only can we expect trials, but we also, in God's strength and in God's grace, accept trials. And that's hard to do. Sometimes we just want every way in the world. I don't know about you, but many times I spend so much time trying to figure out how to get pain out of my life. I don't welcome pain. I'm not one of those that when, when a difficulty comes into my life, I just say, whoa, thank you, Lord, for this difficulty. No, no. Scripture says be thankful in all things, but not for all things. So I'm thankful for what God is going to accomplish in a particular trial, but I'm not thankful for the trial itself because it's so many times painful. But yet James says, accept the trials, verses three and four. Trials build endurance and wholeness. There's a purpose for the trials in our lives, whether they be physical trials or emotional trials or financial trials or spiritual trials. Whatever the trial is, it serves a purpose. And regardless of how it got there or how it came to you, we have the promise in Romans 8 that God says he will cause all things, no matter what it is, to work together for, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So regardless of where the trial may be that has come into your life, whatever form it takes, God is the only one that can take it, regardless of the source, and yet produce something fruitful in your life. So in that sense, in that mindset, we can accept the trials. God loves us too much to leave us where we are. When we face trials in our lives without the right perspective from the Spirit, we will become either bitter or better. I want to become better. I don't want to become bitter. Many times in my life I've been tempted to become bitter, and there's been times in my life I have become bitter. I always like better more than bitter. So the trials, when we accept the trials and we have the right perspective, then we can become better. Look what it says again, cross-referencing in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under the trial. For when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. Blessed is the child. Blessed is the student. Blessed is the person who stands firm in the trial. So we trust God when, when those trials come, we just immediately run to God and said, okay, I accept this. I'm not gonna complain, I'm not gonna get angry at you, I'm not gonna curse your name, I'm not gonna walk away from you, I'm not gonna try to handle this on my own. I run to you, Lord, because regardless of the source of this trial, I accept it that it's a reality in my life, but I'm coming to you because you're the only one that can handle it as you live your life through me. Thirdly, trust God through the trials. Expect trials, accept trials, and trust God through the trials. Notice I said through the trials. Like I said at the very beginning, many times we can only really see the growth in our lives, in our spiritual lives, or maybe in our relationships or what have you, when we go through a trial looking back. And when you're looking back and you see what you've learned and how you've grown through a trial, what does that tell you? You have come through the trial and you're looking back. When we need wisdom, we need to go to God. Once again, it says there, said in verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. At times when I am visiting with someone that comes and we just need to talk to somebody or they need to visit with a pastor or we just discuss it, at the very beginning, before I even know maybe what it is that they want to talk about or what they want to discuss or what they're maybe dealing with through their life, every time the very first thing that I do is I say, hey, can we pray together? And they almost every time say, yes, yes, I'd appreciate that. And I just pray and I just say, Lord, in this time that we're going to visit, I just pray, you know, your word says that if any of you lacks wisdom to ask of God because you give abundantly and generously. And Lord, I don't have the wisdom as I come alongside and anything I might offer 
at this time, but you do. Lord, we pray for your wisdom, whatever the situation may be. Verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Then look what it says in verse 16. Do not be deceived, uh, my beloved brothers. And verse 17, I should say. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above. Comes down from the Father of lights. So when we trust God through the trials, we may be right in the middle of it. Right in the midst, and, and I know you've had trials like this. I've certainly had trials like this in my life where I'm in the midst of it, and I'm, I'm at an end, and I just say, God, I, I don't know why this has happened. I don't understand it. I, I, I don't like it. It's painful. It's hurtful. And, it's, it's, it, and this is fresh on my mind, and recently a major trial that our family went through. And I remember saying, God, I, I, I can't ever thank you for what's happened. But I can be thankful in the midst of what's happened that somehow, some way, you're going to bring honor and glory to yourself and to your name. And because we know you and we have our faith is in you, somehow, some way, this will all work out. Why? Romans 8. Because you will cause this to work together for our, for our good somehow some way. And that's just simply a matter of saying, Lord, I don't know why this has happened. I can't even tell you where this has come from. Or maybe it's a circumstance where you said, oh Lord, I realize I really blew it. I made a decision, a rash decision, and now I'm paying the price for it. Or maybe it's someone else has done something to you and hurt you, and you're in the midst of saying, Lord, I don't know why that person did this. Whatever the source of it may be, but to come to the Lord and say, but Lord, through it all, I am going to trust you. And I'm not going to move just on feelings because feelings will lie to you. Feelings will let you down. But no, it's a decision to trust God and to walk and step out with him. So you trust God through the trials, James says. And then finally, when the trials come in our lives, when the trials come in our lives and we expect them and we accept them, May not like them, but we accept them. And we trust God through them, then we will experience growth through the trials. James says, grow through the trials. Verses seven and eight. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But, but what has he said earlier? He says, let him go in faith without doubting because you're like a double-minded person when you're doubting. But when we come through that trials, we'll see growth in, our, in ourselves. Matthew, um, we, and why do we want to grow? We want to grow for God's benefit. Show God's faithfulness. Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, let your light shine before men. Now, it doesn't mean show off in front of men. It just simply means live out your faith, your constant faith and trust in God, not for a show, but, but, but also knowing that you'll be watched, that you'll be seen. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. When someone endures and goes through trials with their faith intact in God, and people are watching him saying, you know, they're watching and saying, what is different about that person? Ultimately coming through that trial, it brings glory to God. And it's about him. And it's about his glory. So grow for God's benefit. Secondly, grow for your own benefit. Grow for your own benefit. You will be able to handle greater challenges that life will bring. And some of the challenges that I've gone through in my life later in life, if God had laid out my life before me and showed me that in, say, eighth grade, I probably would have checked out right then and said, oh my, no, I don't want to live. I don't want to live if that's what I'm going to have to face. But no, God prepares you along the way with each, coming through each trial. And as you grow and you trust him and you, you take that next step and you enter that next chapter of life, he prepares you. 
So you grow for your benefit because then when you are mature, as, as the scripture says here, is that we will go through these various trials, verses three, um, that you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And it's a glorious thing when you look back and you realize how God has carried you through a trial and you're stronger for it. Your faith is stronger. Your trust is stronger. Your intimacy with Jesus is stronger. And then finally, grow for others' benefits. You can help others through challenges of life. So you go through a trial in your life and you experience God's care and, and God's, God's strengthening through that and God carrying you through that. God will bring into your path people who are experiencing heartache and difficulties and challenges and tests in their lives. And there is one of the most comforting things is for someone to be able to talk to another person, a believer, and that person say, I know what it's like. I've been there. I've been there. And you can make it through this. Let me tell you how it worked in my life. God can use you to strengthen, to encourage others. And as the body of Christ, that's what we're here for. Not only do we submit ourselves to God and in our relationship with him vertically, but we also relate horizontally. And then what did Jesus say? Bear one another's burdens. Come alongside one another and encourage one another. Remember what Jesus said that the mark of true discipleship or his disciples was not going to be how much you know, whether or not every aspect of your theology is absolutely spot on. What did he say? No, they will know that you're my disciples, what? By your love one for another. When the world looks in and sees us loving one another, supporting one another, encouraging one another, considering others as more important than yourselves, bearing one another's burdens because of what you've experienced in your life and how you've been built up and you've, you've been strengthened, then as the world looks on and says, my, how they love one another. So the purpose of the trials and what comes into our lives is so that we grow for God's benefit and for his glory, that we grow for our benefit as we, stre- we grow and we and become stronger in our Christian faith, but also growing for others' benefits as we encourage and build up one another. Now all of this is against the backdrop of faith. This isn't just a positive message. James wasn't just giving us some principles to live by. He wasn't just giving us some encouragement or some PowerPoints, if you will, for life, for successful living. No, all of this is rooted in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's what all of this is based on is that relationship with God through Jesus. You might say, you know what, I've been wondering about that and I've been praying about that. And maybe you've, you've thought about that. Maybe, maybe even you made some sort of a decision a long time ago. But just even in the last few days or maybe a few weeks or maybe these last few minutes, you're not sure about that. You know, the scripture says, you know, <clears throat> the book of John, he says that these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. It doesn't have to be something you guess about. It's not something that you say, well, I hope when all this is over, I can, I I can go to heaven. No, these things have been written that you may know. How do you do that? Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth in the book of Romans, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you have questions about your relationship with with God or the Bible or God or Jesus or faith in general, then there's going to be a number on your screen that you can text. And one of our pastors would love to reach out to you and come alongside you and encourage you. I hope you'll take advantage of that. I hope you'll think seriously about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm grateful that God came to me many years ago and offered me the hope of a relationship with him. And let me tell you, 
and going through the trials of life and the challenges of life that God has, that, that, that has come about in my life, whether for myself because of poor decisions or others or the devil coming against me or sometimes just things that God has brought in my life to, for, to test me so that I might succeed, not to tempt me to see me fail. I'm grateful that for that relationship. I could not have made it without the relationship with Jesus. My faith. I want to pray and then uh, Pastor Lewis is going to come back up and give us some more information and some announcements. Lord, I just pray that as we've looked at your word, we've worshipped you in singing. We've studied your word. We've come to you in faith, asking that you might open the eyes of our heart to you that we would open our minds, Lord, I pray that you will take your word and plant it deeply in our lives so that, Lord, we will live it out. We'll experience it in, the, in, in this week that lies ahead. That through those trials, we'll grow for your sake, we'll grow for our own sake, and, Lord, we'll also grow for the sake of others. And, Lord, if there's a person that has not yet placed their faith and trust in Jesus... I pray that they'll do that right now. I ask all these things in the strong and powerful and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Pastor Scott, thank you so much for sharing such an incredible practical, helpful message on struggling with adversity and trials in a time where we're all struggling with what we're going through in our country right now. And so, North Klein members and guests, thank you so much for being with us today. And one thing I want to share with you before we go is, you know, we're all going through a difficult time right now. And and you may be particularly struggling with something that's overwhelming you. Maybe it's fear, anxiety, worry, Maybe it's anger or just frustration, loneliness, discouragement, depression. And we just want to let you know that your staff is here to help. And one way that we want to help is we have made ourselves available for you to set up an appointment uh, to chat with us during the week that we can spend time praying with you and praying over you. And so if you would like to connect with any of the pastors or ministers on our staff, All you have to do is go to our main website, championforest.org, scroll down to weekly news, click on North Klein, and we've got a new link called Come Alongside. And if you'll click on Come Alongside, then you'll see all the ministers and pastors on our staff, and we've each carved out several hours during the week for you to set an appointment with us. We don't have all the answers but we'd love to pray with you and pray for you and seek God with you because he does have the answers. And so feel free. We welcome you to come set up an appointment with us, and we'd love to chat with you this week. So thanks again for joining us. We pray you have a great week. Take care, and God bless.